Well, welcome to the More to the Story podcast. And those of you who follow this podcast on a regular basis, you'll know that I have highlighted the significant changes that are coming in the United Methodist Church regularly. And so today we are going to get a slightly different perspective than what I have shared in the past. And I think you'll appreciate it. So hang on here. I think you're going to really value this conversation. Now, make sure you know that this podcast is brought to you by Wesley Biblical Seminary, where we are developing trusted leaders for faithful churches. And we have people who are we're training across the denominational spectrum, but particularly those who come in the pan Wesleyan movement. And when I say that, I mean, United Methodist, um, Global Methodist, now Independent Methodist, Congregational Methodist. I bet you didn't even know there's so many Methodist groups, uh, Protestant Methodist, Methodist, Salvationist, Nazarene, Free Methodist, all that group, and non-denominational groups, of course, and people from all kinds of traditions. We would love for you to think about coming here. And we have a variety of lay initiatives as well, particularly the Wesley Institute, which just started, but you can still get in on it. It's where we go through all 66 books of the Bible with a seminary professor on a weekly basis. It's just a great leadership training technique uh, program that we'd love for you to look into. So you can find out all about WBS at wbs.edu. Also, this podcast is brought to you by Bill Roberts, who's a financial planner who helps people, particularly people who are involved in um, like complicated things with ministry, like housing allowance and that type of thing. And he helps people plan for retirement in a great way with Christian principles. So I encourage you to check out his website. You can find a link in my website, but it's williamhroberts.com. And finally, if you are interested in what it would take to maybe go just a little bit deeper in your own teaching and preaching, I've developed this really kind of quick tool, like this, like a mini course, so to speak, Five Steps to Deeper Teaching and Preaching. It's a 45-minute video that I've recorded and then an eight-page document that helps people move through their own you know, biblical exegesis with the aim of thinking about how they can present in a creative way to their congregations. So check that out at my website, andymillerthe3rd.com. That's Andy Miller, I, I, I. Com. And you get that if you sign up for my email list. It'll be the first thing you see on my website. All right. I am bringing in my guest here, my friend, <laughs> Reverend Brian Jones, who <laughs> serves as a pastor of the Gary United Methodist Church. He is an elder from actually the Indiana Conference. And mm -hmm. I need to say before I even let you say anything, Brian, you are kind of like a big brother to me. I grew up as the <laughs> big brother. And so I need big brothers. And when I arrived at Asbury University back in... Uh, 1998 last sponsor was there to greet me brian was there and, and sarah miller knew my name when i arrived there and then i had the privilege of having him on my hall making sure that i did all the right things so brian welcome to the podcast oh uh, and uh, and reverend dr andrew miller the third <laughs> it is it is a joy to be with you i'm you know, I just got back from a youth retreat. I was one of the mentors there. I'd run confirmation where we help kids uh, give them opportunity to accept Christ as Lord and Savior. So it just came off that. Then I'm, I'm at home today in okay. my home office wearing my Muhammad Ali uh, oh. Frazier's sweatshirt, my Cubs hat, because I don't want you to get the, the oh. glare off my bald head. <laughs> oh, I didn't know that had happened in the oh, last yeah. 20 years. Yeah, look there at it that, is. Man. Wow. Look Congratulations. It is. Yeah. So, and I have no vanity about it, but okay. man, where I've learned over these COVID years, where I put the camera, it hits right here and just blinds people. Wow. <laughs> so I wear my Cubs hat and, you know, I, and I get to speak to you. This is just a joy for me. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, it's kind of hard if, if, if we ever disagree about anything, I feel like I just have to submit because like <laughs> certainly in a hallway wrestling match, you would have won. And so I just feel like I have to give in to you. you know? <laughs> no, no way. No, you don't. I'm, I'm wrong on so many things, Andy. No, it's great. <laughs> Man, and, and that was such it, it, the university that both Brian and I attended has this uh, uh, process that they go through like a tradition where two seniors sponsor the freshman class. Mm -hmm. So Brian and they, they have to like run. They have to get elected for that mm -hmm. coveted position. And so Brian <laughs> did that for my class. And I'll just have a shout out to all my uh, fellow abiding classmates, oh, gosh, class of yes. 2002. You named the class, Brian. That yeah, was we did. Yeah. Me and Sarah Joe. Yeah, Sarah Jo Miller and yeah, go golly, what a get! I mean, really, one of the as I look back on my life, yeah, that sure. is going to be one of the most um, things that I am most thankful for, most formative for. Y'all sure. were such wonderful, like 
I couldn't have y'all formed me so much more mm. than I did. And, you know, Sarah, Joe, and that friendship that we've had for years, those are, yeah, I miss, I hated that. I couldn't be there this summer for the, Oh, right. For the 20th because 20. of uh, family stuff, but sure. yeah, yeah. It's yeah. good. Well, hey, you know, Brian, maybe some, some people might know you some, uh, you know, some of maybe our abiding people are catching up with you right now, but maybe yeah. you just give people a short sketch of, uh, you know, what happened after college. Like, so you went on a seminary and been serving churches yeah. after that. Um, just get, catch us up with where you are. Yes. Yes. Let's see. So after Asbury, um, and if we get into it later, I'll talk about my call at Asbury yeah, sure. and, and how, but, um, I, uh, you know, I met my wife at, uh, um, Methodist church camp. We literally yeah. met each other. I mean, it sounds cheesy, but we literally met each other doing altar calls. There like you that's go. How, like that's how we met. And, um, you know, she felt a real call to, um, to go to the Holy Spirit. She's a year older than me. So she felt a real call by the Holy Spirit to go to Duke. And I didn't have that at all. I, yeah. I had no, I guess I always assumed I'd go to Asbury Seminary like yeah, just sure. across the street, but you know, we were getting married and I wanted to, uh, and she just really felt that she was like, I don't know why, but this is where God's calling me. Yeah, and sure. I said, I said, well, yeah. I, so, uh, I went to Duke, but there were several other Asbury people who went, uh, Josh Dittber, Rob Basner, Matt Schlim. Yes, um, yeah. And then a whole kind of a crew of Asbury folks afterwards, um, kind of went to Duke and uh, I got my MDiv there. I worked for the Duke Youth Academy for Christian Formation, which was a Lilly project, which I loved. Um, I was the assistant director there. And um, so I worked for Duke, but in a, in a Christian capacity for a ministry, which was awesome. Yeah. And it helped kids um, come to a deeper relationship with Christ. And um, so while Beth was finishing up her PhD, so she did her MTS um, yeah. and then her PhD. And then she went on. And so I always figured her job is going to lead because those jobs are always way harder to get than. Yes. <laughs> then, uh, we can affirm this yes and so uh she went to huntington university uh which is a small evangelical brethren college outside of fort wayne indiana and sure. so i was from southern indiana and so i moved up to northern indiana um and in indiana in the methodist church united methodist church those were two separate conferences right right and so uh i went up there and uh started my ordination process and pastored a small church um, and uh, learned a lot. Uh, I won't go into all of that, but shout out to Christ's United Methodist Church and literally yeah. C-R-I-S-T uh, apostrophe S, Christ's United Methodist Church. There you go. <laughs> and, uh, uh, Just and to make then, sure who it belongs to. <laughs> exactly. And, uh, and uh, then uh, Beth got the call to teach um, systematic theology at um, at Wheaton, Wheaton college. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so we moved to Wheaton, um, where our fourth child was born and I had a church, uh, faith United Methodist church in Lombard, which is just like 10 minutes away. Yeah. And, um, they, gr they were growing and then we had Zeke, our youngest Hezekiah. And at that point, uh, Beth was going through tenure I was, the church was growing again. These are good things. Yeah. Sure. But I was just like, man, and I felt like the Holy spirit was really calling me to take some time off. So I took about four years off all the way oh, wow. until Zeke was in kindergarten. I, okay. um, and I stayed, I was the stay at home parent and there you did go. that for, uh, I took family leave and we started going to a church called Gary church, uh, which is, um, which is kind of a downtown big congregation in, in uh, Wheaton. Okay. And um, I had friends from Div school who went there and uh, loved the preaching there. It was uh, like, I grew up um, uh, uh, Tracy Malone was the pastor there. She is now um, she's, and she is now Bishop okay. but, uh, uh, in East Ohio. But um, you know, I went there and, uh, the new pastor came and he said, Hey, Brian, I think, you know, maybe 
have you ever thought about coming back into ministry? And I said, absolutely. Yes, I have. And he's like, well, um, you know, and I said, it's funny because I was going to have that conversation with you. He's like, well, would you like to be a my associate pastor? So I actually started going to the church yeah, as, interesting. with my family and yeah. I didn't do anything because I didn't want to step on anybody's Right, toes. sure. Uh, other pastors, there's the only thing I, I taught third grade Bible. Okay. And, uh, yeah. And because uh, that's when we give them their Bible, we teach them how to use it and basic. And so then I, I became on staff and I taught confirmation. That first crew I ever did, that was my first, those were my confirmation classes. They're yeah. all, they're all in college now. This is their first wow. year. So I had that crew all the way through in different things. When I was not a pastor, I was just the dad of the congregation. Then yeah. when I was their pastor. And so I've, it's been, uh, this is beginning my eighth year at Gary wow. church and it's been just a joy. I, I love that place. I love the congregation. I love my senior pastor and the staff. It has been a real blessing to me, but yeah, I, I came to it a little bit weirdly. That's yeah. not how it, most of it works in the Methodist church. In a lot of ways, it's more like an independent church where you start going there and then you kind of get pulled up through the leadership and you're one of the pastors. Sure. But sure. It was, it was weird, but I'm, very providential. <laughs> yeah. And it's interesting too. Like, uh, I, I had heard of your wife before I knew she was your wife, Brian. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> it's kind of a fun and I've never met her in person yet. You know, we've uh, interacted a little bit online, but, oh, yeah. uh, so that that's been fun. And just to know of the work she's doing and the way you oh. guys are working as a team to, um, you know, enable her scholarly work to happen and her work oh. on behalf of trained students. So now, now she's no longer at Wheaton, right? Right, right. Yeah. She just moved to Northern Seminary, which is a Baptist seminary. Uh, and she loves it. I was going to say other probably people, um, uh, NJ, who's a New Testament yeah, scholar, sure. Scott McKnight, yeah, um, sure. Lynn Kohick. Those are all people at Northern. It's a great place. It's a smaller seminary, but I th as much as she loved Wheaton, and it's mm -hmm. a, um, I think it is nice for her to feel called to teach pastors. Right. She really has uh, a desire to teach pastors. And oh yeah, she's way more famous than me. No. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, which I, I mean... love. No, oh, yeah, no, it like most of the time I am Dr. Jones's husband and, right. or, or, uh, and that is never a thing for me. I mean, she's, she is smart and caring and Christ-like and thoughtful. Uh, so it is, it is, and, you know, just to be a part of her life and, and be in ministry with her has just been a tremendous blessing. So, awesome. and so you've been able to do she, like, she's, she was doing that full time and then mm -hmm. you took the four years off and now are you, you're, you're part time, right? Yeah. Yeah. So you can, mm -hmm. I, I've always taken part, part time. And the reason is a couple, a, couple reasons is one i always wanted to be there to be home with the kids when they come home from school yeah. like um that was an important thing for for me uh it's by the way it's important for beth it's not that yeah just, i understand he has to teach classes like yeah. there's no you know and so um i always wanted to be there as long as i could and um, that gives me that flexibility. It, it also in the meth in the United Methodist world, um, I am on loan from northern from from Indiana from right. to northern Illinois. So Indiana, it never really bothered because um, you know as the church grew where I was that in Indiana when I left, what they were going to need was a full time pastor. Mm -hmm. um, and so. Um, but when I left, Indiana was not like upset about it. I'm one less mouth they have to feed, right? Yeah, sure, <laughs> right? sure. Interesting. And, and in Northern Illinois, um, you know, they've been wonderful, but they were like, I, I asked for a, a, a non-full-time church for our own reasons, but also then I have way more options. Mm -hmm. um, I've never had, and and they are not a mouth I, they have to feed because they need people to take part-time jobs. It's the yeah, full-time sure. jobs that, that are the hard ones. Right. And so I started off less than full. It, it, it's keep adding up. I'm really about 60, three quarters time. But my, my senior pastor was like, Brian says that, but he's really full-time. <laughs> 
<laughs> but, I'm sure but there's uh, not really a way to distinguish if you put your hours in I'm sure that's what it would be but yeah. I I love it there so yeah so it has given me um and the other thing is uh in the you know I'm at this church if you're full-time you're itinerant which yes. means they can move you at any point even if right. you say I would rather really not and so not being full-time has allowed me to stay here near Beth's job and with my kids school and that's been a real 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 blessing yeah, yeah. that's great oh well, I love I love getting caught up on that I think even though we've talked a few times over the last few years like to yeah. be able to get get even I'm learning things there you know we probably had a decade where we didn't talk at all yeah no communication and exactly. that was in a time where I might have saw Beth's book on sexuality and I'm, yeah and then somebody told me later oh that's Brian's what oh, so it's great. <laughs> really fascinating so okay now you're we're in the part of what led to this was mm -hmm. I have had on Keith Boyette from yeah. uh, now with the Global Methodist Church, was the WCA. Yeah. I've had Mark Tooley, I've had Good Rob man. Renfro, yeah. and soon, probably before this even comes out, I'll have Jeff Greenway and Bishop Lowry to talk mm -hmm. about their book. So I've, in, there's no doubt about the seminary where I work is a, is like we are aligned with those mm -hmm. who are you know pro coming into the Global Methodist Church. So I mean, we still serve and we'll be serving United Methodist. I'm positive sure. of that going forward. So. Uh, I, I saw something that you posted and it, it just mm -hmm. brought a question to my mind. And so I want to get into talk about that, like what's going on in the Global Methodist Church and the mm -hmm. United Methodist Church and mm -hmm. your decision to stay. But even as we get there, like recognizing that you come at this as somebody who has been engaged in the challenges of the United Methodist Church since you were like 18 years old. You were a, oh, yeah. a, a delegate, right? I remember learning yeah. about this. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, just to go back a, a, a little bit, how I came to that, the church, the church is my, my father is a pastor. Okay. And um, he's an elder. It was in the Southern Indiana Conference and now the, I mean, the South Indiana Conference and now the Indiana Conference. Um, and so when, when we grew up, they were mostly, my parents have always felt a call to the poorest and the the oppressed right like okay they're they're very much G when they went to asbury it's very much like the jesus movement right like yeah sure jesus, sure right and so they are very much um in a lot of ways formed by that and um so it was always to the poorest and and uh you know that was my dad's family that was my mother's family right yeah. like kind of and in indiana the uh especially when i was growing up the poorest places are the rural places sure sure and um so i grew up in these little you know i met these churches a lot of times more than one dad had yeah. one and he was on a charge right yes and um but those were the places that taught me to love the scripture to yeah. to know jesus christ as my lord and savior to confess my sins to follow him and put him first so those were those are those places and so um uh my dad was involved in the annual conference so like in sixth grade i was 11 years old the first time i went to annual conference wow and i was a delegate uh to annual conference and at 11 that, yeah at 11 <laughs> <laughs> and this uh, is not a normal thing for no, everybody outside no, of Methodist world no. is not 11 year olds don't do that very often. No, no, no. And so I was a delegate to annual conference, which is, the, you know, Indiana. Um, and uh, so we, all the Methodists got together. And, you know, for me, those those systems were just affirming about, you know, making Christ Lord and Savior. And as I as I got older. I yeah. realized that not everybody in annual conference <laughs> agrees with, with me. Um, right. And so, uh, but I always felt that the majority of the Methodists in uh, United Methodists in, um, you know, uh, South Indiana, well, Indiana generally were more tended to be for, had my experience. So my whole point was just to witness and allow more people like me to be a part of the process. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, when I was a senior in high school, I was elected to general conference and I wasn't elected through like, there's a general general in the United Methodist church means global. Right. right? Good word. Yeah. It's so, good. yeah. So general, um, there's a general youth organization 
and they get representatives because they're part of this general board for the you know the global but not me i was elected from southern indiana i think i was the first youth ever elected wow. and um so i got to and i was you know an, an evangelical kid and um so those were those experiences of you know you have to write out what you believe uh, yep. how you how you think about things and yeah and i was pretty high up there too like uh, on the i think i was third or fourth elected wow. um which was really interesting um so i got to learn a lot those those people who i went with um god bless them like they, mm. <laughs> they were so they were so helpful but that is how i um you know, I, I was involved with the evangelical groups in Indiana, but then I became much more um, in the world. And I was in all those rooms, like the good news rooms. And those people probably didn't even remember me at all. But I was that quiet kid who is sitting there listening to all those discussions because I don't think they knew what to do with me. Like I was like randomly brought in with um, with uh, with uh, that's how I met our friend Rob Basner from Asbury okay. like I literally met Rob at general conference because his pastor was one of the big within the uh, renewal movements <laughs> and uh Riley Case was his reverend reverend Dr. Riley Case and uh that's how I met him and uh he was my roommate Josh's uh friend from Kokomo Indiana and so from an early age I was in those rooms not contributing much but listening and seeing right. how things happened. And it was, it was an education. I will say that it was an education. So then as you kind of make your way through, like going through Asbury University, then Duke, then mm -hmm. serving in a church and being aware of conversations, then, you know, also via the, the type of conversations your wife is a part of in the academy, like mm -hmm. you're like, you're connected to what's going on. And I don't yeah. know, we don't really need to go I don't think we need to go through the history. I think people can go back and look at some of the other podcasts that we've had yeah. to, to talk about like, you know, how there's been successive uh, general conferences every four years and mm -hmm. uh, the, the statements that are in the discipline, the rule book, so to speak of the mm -hmm. United Methodist church about uh, marriage being between one man and one woman. And right. that, and, you know, any homosexual behaviors outside the tradition, Christian tradition and practice. Mm -hmm. I'm not getting the exact right language there. But no, no, like, you're fine. You, you, yeah, that, yeah. that's all been affirmed and and you're glad for that like you're glad that the discipline's there right i mean this yeah, is you yeah. are and i'm gonna like an orthodox person like you you are <laughs> yes. in that like there's nothing that you would have heard and the theology or biblical interpretation side of that good news room which we're talking about a group for those those outside of methodism kind yeah. of like a political action group within the life of the church we had rob brinfro and if i on a um, few few weeks ago uh, that's right the president of that so you, you're you're aligned with that movement theologically right yeah 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 and i've been in those groups i will say that i was much more when i was younger and that has nothing to do because i went to northern illinois okay right like all of a sudden even though i'm part of the indiana conference I can't be a leader in that caucus group there anymore right? because, sure, sure, sure. because I'm not. And, and plus we had great leaders. We had there's also a political leaders. reality, right? I mean, yes, there's a political, there, there was a Brian Jones, not, not really, there could never be another Brian Jones, but there were people who had <laughs> grown up in that conference. Right. And like, yeah, it's a whole nother social structure. Yeah. Yeah. And it would have been, uh, I don't, how would I say it, it would have been bad form. Right for sure, me sure. to even because I'm in an in an extension ministries in Northern Illinois, it would have been bad form for me to try to be a part of the good news leadership or I mean the and um, the confessing movement is what right, we call sure, it sure, in, yeah. in uh, Indiana and that would have been a uh, yeah that but we had great leaders anyway like we had Greg McGarvey we had uh, Beth Ann Cook we had sure, you know, Riley sure. Case we had all these wonderful you know they didn't they didn't need old Brian uh. <laughs> they you know but uh, John Lon Paris right who yeah you know, sure there was, they had a lot of good leaders that they didn't need me um, but yeah so so that is why I 
um, once I moved to Indiana, I wasn't as involved in it. But I, when I went to annual conference, you know, those are the people I knew. Those are the people right. I voted for. Those are the people I, I went to the good news lunches, right? Like those were, yeah, yeah. So so that's, that's helpful. So like that might then be a surprise to folks. And this is why I wanted to have you on is mm-hmm. like your intention. And this is a big question. I know, like I know, sure. asking, but I like know. your intention is not to leave the United Methodist Church. And honestly, oh, it's been uh, in e- even though I ended up did going, I did attend Asbury Theological Seminary after Asbury University. Sure. I have many uh, peers from my time there who are uh, articulating similar things to you. Honestly, it's all been a surprise to me because as a salvationist, kind of looking from the outside in, mm-hmm. I see this and I think great. You guys are finally free to, you know, become, you know, what God's made you to be like, why not Mm -hmm. let's, and, and as people have articulated, there's a short window of time for people to leave the Methodist church, particularly churches to leave. So tell me like, so Brian, what's the deal? Yeah, no, these, it's a great question. Um, so I think I'm going to have to back up just a okay, little bit. Sorry, Andy. Sorry, no, yeah. no, 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 no. I think I'm going to have to back up to, for people maybe to understand why I'm coming from, because I think yeah, a yeah. lot of people are asking really good questions like you would, right? Like, why is this person who's an evangelical um, uh, and who self-identifies that way? Yeah. Um, why would they be staying in the United Methodist Church? So I think that's a, a good question. And partly, I'm, I'm not going to try to answer for everybody else. I'm yeah, that's right. For, for me, but um, I, I think it. I need to tell this story. Like I told you, I grew up in, like in the United Methodist Church is where I came to to love scripture. It's where yeah. I came to know Christ as my, my, my Lord and savior, right? Like to accept, forgive for my sins and to hear about the message of sanctification and holiness. Yeah. Right. I, I will say that the, probably the thing that has formed me a lot was, and like I told you, right, I've been involved in the church, but I gotta be honest, and Andy, from my sophomore year in high school, through my sophomore year in college were probably the the worst for me spiritually mm. in a lot of ways mm. i was um those were tough times and they're times i don't always like to think about because not because i'm embarrassed but because i know i i hurt people like mm. it was a, it was equal parts mix of like spiritual arrogance hypocritical living and self-loathing right right wow. like and so so I was not who I wanted to to be. I I hurt other people and um you know hurt those who I loved. Um and and when you know that you've hurt people, not only have you hurt them, but those hurts are probably gonna last for the rest of their lives. Hmm. Like you and there's and you can't get that back, right? Hmm. Like like you can't. There, there's no making that up. Um, and I just, uh, I was, I was not, I was not following Christ as I should. Mm. And so, yeah, in that whole time, like there was the United Methodist Church, there was, there was, you know, my friends at Asbury College, there were, there was Asbury College Institution, there were, there were churches I knew, all these places in the midst of, of knowing my struggles and where I was, they were also faithful to me, right? When I was not being faithful. And most importantly, Christ was faithful to me Mm -hmm. when Mm -hmm. I was not being faithful. When I was in eighth grade, I was I was baptized and I was confirmed and I made Mm -hmm. promises to, to make Christ as my Lord and savior. And I won't go through all the baptismal promises, but you know, like, and also to be a faithful, to, to be a faithful member of the church. And I take those things extremely seriously. Like, Um, And and part of it is from this experience, because I know that I was not living up to the covenant I made. Mm -hmm. And, but they were, they were faithful to me, even though there were things they didn't approve of. They were like, Brian, God's still here. God's searching for you. Um, 
we still see gifts and talents in you yeah during that same time which is probably the first times i heard my calling mm. right wow but um but i also knew i wasn't living one like i should yeah. two um my father was a pastor and i didn't want to be a pastor because my father was a pastor right and then three I was uh, dating Beth and she sent, she was living in the slums of Nairobi. And like, mm. she sent me these letters that was like, Hey, I feel like God's calling me to ministry. At that point, she wasn't for sure what kind of ministry it was yet. Yeah. I was like, for me, I thought she meant pastor. And I was like, well, if she's going to, well, I'm, I'm definitely not doing it. So there yeah. was a lot of things, but the church was still seeing things in me and was being faithful sure. even when I wasn't. So, and I'm so thankful and it wasn't always like they were like, it's going to be okay, Brian. It was, it was tough love. Like I especially think of those guys who I was in a small group with like John Roberts, Josh, Wes Freeman. Like those were guys who, um, who saw me every week and prayed with me and called out a lot of things in my life. And, um, and plus my parents, uh, yeah. that was the other thing. Like my parents were never, and, I, this is what I love about them. They, and probably why all of us is, as Joan siblings, we have a good relationship with church as a pair is, is compared to most preachers, kids, at least a lot of them we met later was like, our parents treated us the same in private as they mm. did in public. Mm. Uh, like there was no, and they also didn't talk about church stuff. I mean, they talked about church, but right. they, didn't, they didn't complain about people. Like, because there were some people who they did not get along with, but had real strong impacts in my faith. And they didn't want to come between that. But my parents were the kind of people, like I said, who treated me the same as in public as in private. Mm -hmm. And we had a really close relationship. They knew all these things. And my parents were like, listen, Brian, this is a, this is not what God's calling you to. Right. Mm. Like, mm -hmm. and so I don't want to make it sound like that the church was in any way, like soft peddling me, like, I, you know, they, and so when my sophomore year, I remember like really struggling with God saying, God, I want to live not just a life where I know that you have forgiven me of my sins. I want to live a life where I am living like Christ and that holiness message of the, of the Methodist tradition of the Wesleyan tradition really came over me. And, um, by the grace of God, I, I felt like I was changed. I didn't have entire sanctification. I don't mean it like that, but things changed. Mm -hmm. And so when you met me, I was a very different person than I had been just three or four years ago. Sure. And, um, and so it, it was, as I was going to be an RA at Asbury college and I, I was just like, you know, so this idea of being faithful to somebody, even when they are not being faithful. Right. Right. Was, and, and being faithful to vows, even when somebody else isn't really was a thing that formed me importantly. Um, and so my, my vows, I've made vows for, um, for membership in the church, you know, at my confirmation, but also then I made ordination vows. And for me, it's not something I can give up on because the Holy Spirit hasn't let me. Um, mm -hmm. I want to be very clear if, and I, I've, I've talked, we've talked about this before, but I just think it's important to say like, man, people who, uh, who are going to the global Methodist church, I, I am happy for them. I, I feel like God is calling them that like, this is not me being judgmental. I'm like, I'm so I, superior yeah. because I'm holding to my vows. That's, that's not what I'm saying. I'm just trying to tell you like where I'm coming from. Right. So, so for me, um, it comes from this deep sense of, of being, of being faithful and witnessing. So I remember um, probably around 2000, uh, I remember it was my, I was talking to a friend from Indiana and we were talking about the, the, the church and how things were going. And I said, um, I talked to him and I said, you know, man, like, I think we're, 
I, I think we're going to win. <laughs> I mean, that's the evangelicals, right? I was like, I think we're going to win this thing. And he was like, I don't know. I, he's like, I hope the church splits and we just hmm. go our separate ways. And yeah. I was like, I was like, man, I think we're going to win. Why don't you, why do you want to stay and win? And afterwards, um, that night I couldn't sleep for a couple of nights. So I was like, what's, what's going on with me? And, um, I remember I didn't hear an audible voice. I never hear an audible voice of God. Never have anyway, maybe someday, but I never Hopefully, have. Yeah. 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 <laughs> That'd be great. I'll take it. I'll take it. <laughs> but I've never had that experience, um, personally, but I did feel like God in my soul saying, Brian, the reason why you're feeling this way is because it's not about winning. Mm, mm. It's been about witnessing. It's about mm. witnessing to the gospel. And uh, why do you care about winning? Because I sure don't. Mm. I, I, and for, and I was like, gosh, darn it. That's right. Like I got caught up in this thing. And as, as you and I, you know, you and I are both sports fans. It's easy for us to get caught up in competition. You know, yeah, sure. my side wants to win. I want to win. And I got caught up in that. And mm. I was just, uh, and I was just like, Brian, who? So, so it, it reminded me of how I was at the beginning, you know, right. that this was not about, this was never about winning. This was about uh, witnessing. And so, yes. so, so that is where, that is where I am coming from when it comes to staying in the United Methodist Church. And it, it yeah, yeah. So it, this, this is, I can summarize. That's great. So because of your, and, and let me, and forgive me for summarizing something that, no, summarize, that much please. time, but like, so your experience of kind of not being close to the Lord and being somebody who needed the vows directed to uh, upheld in your direction, kind of instilled in you this firm commitment that vows are significant the church particularly a great experience you had growing up was something that you felt called to and so as you've done that now and you've moved through this process and even maintaining an orthodox theology and perspective of where the church should be um realize it's not about winning or losing but witnessing and like that that's the the maybe like creating an either or is a problem in this scenario so here's is that a good is that a fair yeah the way i said that i think that's a fair way of very saying, short said, obviously not as a you did, say, you did a way better job focus uh but because <laughs> no i wanted to hear that actually i think it'll help people it helps me too to understand where you're coming from so here's a question mm -hmm. could the methodist church go far enough to lead it to a place where they're not, they're being so unfaithful to what you signed up for, what you vowed to. I don't know if that's the right way to describe yeah, yeah, yeah. it. Um, that that you would leave. Like, oh like, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. Absolutely. What would that be? So um, I've I have thought about that, and I'm not I'm not quite for sure yet, Andy. I would I wish I could tell you what it was, but yeah, I think um, for me it would so I. I was actually part of this group that got that wanted that wanted general conference to pass Nicaea as, as one of our, the council of Nicaea is one of our founding, uh, right. one, of, one, of, the other one of our doctrinal st standards. Right. Yeah. And actually I think of it as being Catholic, right. Mm -hmm. Be because there has been, th that came up in the forties, fifties and sixties, this idea that Methodists weren't creedal. Right, uh, right, which really bothers me. Sure, um, <laughs> and it wasn't just me. Like I, uh, you know, I went to Duke, and people who weren't wouldn't have identified themselves as evangelicals. Like they were like, "What's this?" Like Nicaea is important, <laughs> right? Like, right, so, right, right, right. So um, I don't mean it to sound like um, I thought it was a way of of allowing um, conversation and uh, and and helping unity. But I was surprised at the backlash we got for it, like, mm. um, and how much people were against it. And it, they were like, they're just going to use that as some kind of, uh, they're just going to use Nicaea as some kind of, uh, you know, crudgel to, to hit people. And I was like, man, that's exactly the opposite of how I was experiencing this. Like mm -hmm. I was thinking, let's introduce Nicaea as a way to have good conversation, even though we disagree. And, I, and 
so I would say anything where the method and here is the problem with the United Methodist Church as I see it. Yeah, the, the Constitution cannot be changed, or it is almost impossible to change it. Mm. But, but the constitute, like what John Wesley wrote, right? Those things can't be changed, which I actually think is a problem, even though I want it upheld. I think that's a problem because what people end up doing is they start using the same language, but mm -hmm. they, they mean very different things when they use the right. same language. Right. And, and so, um, you know, if it can't be changed, it doesn't actually reflect what the people of the church believe. So that's actually one of the problems. I don't think people talk enough about that as Methodists. Hmm. So it actually makes me putting a line in the sand actually harder sure. because, uh, because I could say like, well, you know, it's when they, when they don't believe in the virgin birth or they don't believe in the resurrection, uh, the bodily resurrection, right. sure, or, sure. They, or they don't believe that, that Jesus, is, but, but Andy, they're never going to change that because they can't. Mm, right interesting. constitutionally <laughs> right? Like yeah. constitutionally they can't change that yeah so um but i i guess for me is i don't know i here's what i do know i can't leave the united methodist church without saying i tried that's mm. what i can't do um for for me but i think all those things i just named right Jesus isn't the way of salvation, anything about the Trinity. Sure, sure. <laughs> right? Like, like, it becomes explicit there. Isn't it? They're already so, like, this is one interesting thing is, is in my experience with United Methodists, uh, uh, I, I came in with more of a positive. I'm not in it, actually. Right, right. I came, became an in, in, interaction with it. You know my in-laws. In, yeah, exactly. Uh, in South Georgia. And so I was very connected. To me, it's a beautiful witness of, of the same sort of theology that flows from the kind of the Asbury world that I was a part of. Yeah. But then as I got into other communities and other regions of the country, my, uh, my wife and I served in Texas and Georgia and Florida. Mm -hmm. And I realized, well, not everybody believes in resurrection. And I'm sitting at SMU Perkins and realize I'm the only person in a classroom who believed in the physical resurrection. So oh, I have yeah. that, that side of it. And then much less the fact there's a, I mean, just again, I'm not trying to strong arm the argument at all, but there's no, a no, no. practicing lesbian it. bishop. There is, I, I saw two weeks ago, an article in the, in what, from Western Pennsylvania of a kind of a polyamorous, not just kind yeah. of a polyamorous uh, pastor who's hoping the church will change. I'd solve, I don't know if it's in your conference, but somewhere in Illinois, a drag party uh, within the yeah. life of the, you know, that's the in the Methodist logo. That's in downstate. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> as they would say down here, which I always think is kind of pejorative, but <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. like, uh, because I'm always like, well, uh, in Indiana, I would have lived in downstate, <laughs> but, but this <laughs> is the church you're a part. I mean, yeah. let me just push yeah. it. This is the church that you're yeah. ordained in and they're yes. allowing these things to happen. Yeah, and, yeah. and then there's allowing people to uh, have a, a Christology that's not consistent with the creeds and uh, yeah. like, so that, that I think that's what, where I come, like, I admire your vow, like I admire. And, and honestly, like, I can't, what am, who might stand in the way of somebody say like, God's not releasing me. Look, uh, we'll go there, preach the gospel, help people. Like I, I hope so. Yeah. But as you know, your little brother, so to speak, yeah, like, yeah. I want you to get out, Brian. Like, I don't want yeah. you to have to go through this. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that's, no, I, I totally understand. And I understand where, where a lot of people from the outside, people who are on the left and people who are on the right, theologically, I'm not talking politically. Um, right, right, right. Um, I correct, think correct, would, correct. Not right, yeah, right, right. Yeah, because I actually <laughs> I actually consider myself one of those people who's probably uh, politically more leans left, and but theologically leans right. And I lean politically left because I'm theologically right. Like Interesting, but, yeah, yeah. But that's because I'm an old holiness person. <laughs> okay. <laughs> like that's how the holiness people were back, you know, 150 years ago. But, um, you know, but that that doesn't exist in America much anymore. However, but I think that's important to say, you know, uh, theologically. There's something think, in there. Maybe we can have another podcast about that. But I keep yeah, going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But those two groups, um, you know, uh, you know, I think both of them look at would would look at me in some ways and have consternation like what what's uh, but I think there's a lot of people like me um, yeah. and. Uh, so, uh, but I, I, I totally understand 
where people ask. So you push away, brother. Like you're not uh-huh. hurting my feelings. <laughs> I, I didn't think I could. I didn't think I could. Uh, it's also kind of, I guess it comes down rather or not, this is a, a matter of Christian dogma. Yeah. And this, that there's something about, and your wife's written about this, you know, to a certain degree, like about the reality of Genesis three and mm-hmm. the, the role that uh, the seed of, of, of Adam would play and the seed of David would play. And as we come to the place of like the necessity yeah. of the eternal logos being coming through a female, like the distinction between male and female is so critical that I, I worry about um, the, I, I like, to me, I'll say this is a, this is a matter of orthodoxy. And I, mm. I'm just curious, like, do you feel like it's at that place? Do you think that if we diverge on um, human sexuality in all of its manifestations. So, I mean, you could say LGBTQ agenda and, and that type of yeah. thing. And again, I hope people, every time I say this, I, I, and whenever I preach on the subject, like this does not negate our love for those who are struggling with any sort of, any kind of challenges in this regard or mm-hmm. our ability to welcome people and serve people who suffer in any sort of way or are challenged by these or maybe even just wondering intellectually where they are. So I like, I don't want that to be mm-hmm. the message that's conveyed. So please hear me on that. At the same time, there's an opportunity for us to say like what the church has always taught. And unfortunately, this is like, I think this is the place where it's going to come down. Is this a matter of dogma or is it mere opinion? Yeah, no, I, that's a really good question. It's one I struggle with all the time. Like I, I really, really do. Um, for, for me, here's what I think is dogma is, and here I'm going to sound extremely United Methodist is <laughs> the const is the constitution. Right. Like what John Wesley, the articles of religion from the evangelical United Brethren Church, the articles of of religion from the the the, the old MEC, the Methodist right, Episcopal right, Methodist Church. Episcopal. Yeah. And um, and and for me would be Nicaea, Chalcedon, you know, the ecumenical councils um, and, uh, you know, those are those are dogma. Um uh, so, uh, and I, and I try to keep dogma small because I, I realize that, uh, sometimes we, as the church push things too far. And so, so for example, um, and I totally respect our Roman Catholic brothers and sisters, but, uh, and, you know, and, um, I, I've, I've been listening a lot to, uh, you know, our old Asbury friend, uh, Matt Swaim, who I love, you know, yeah, he's, sure. he's Roman, Four you yeah, like, yeah, yeah. I mean, he has a wonderful Catholic ministry, uh, radio ministry. I've been listening to a lot of the Mary dogmas that they've been doing. And as a Protestant, and, and um, also about the Eucharist, right? Like, but I, there are some things that I think happened at Trent, right? The Council of Trent, which um, I think they were reacting to a certain thing in Protestantism. Um, and weren't always listening to what Protestants were saying <laughs> and right, sure. and reacted in a way that I don't think is consistent with um, w- with the previous one. So I, that, that's why I mean, I, I try to keep those things small. So those are the things that I think are, are dogma, but there's also teachings of the church and how you live faithfully and what the church is taught. But um, I, I think you're getting to a point for, for me, I think because – uh, there's these, I would say there's probably three different groups within the United Methodist Church. There's the evangelicals kind of where, where I'm from. Then there's kind of the progressives. And then you have this group that they, they call themselves centrists. Congratulations. Uh, you made yeah. it to the cent- center. Yeah. <laughs> yeah right. Yeah. Like, and, um, and, and I will say that they will say things like, well, these, these things were, are never going to change the, in the United Methodist Church. I'm like, that's, that's just, the, their pitch to, to evangelicals who are thinking about leaving to go to the global Methodist church. They're like, they're like, things aren't going to change. I'm like, yes, they will. They undoubtedly will. And also uh, they'll say things like, um, you know, we'll never, we'll never change these things. And I'm like, that's, uh, <laughs> that's, that's a false, that's a false bill, man. 
Mm-hmm. Like those, that's not true. Like, why are we separating if you don't want things to change? Like, and I think it's a real, I don't think they're trying to be dishonest per se. I, I always try to read people in the absolute best light. However, um, I just don't think that's true. But the problem is like, I'll, they'll say things, they'll say things like, we believe Jesus is the way and the truth and the life. And we believe in the bodily resurrection. Andy, I have been at annual conference where there are people who I love who are on the same row as me and they don't believe I've listened to their sermons Mm. and they have told me personally, they don't believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ Mm. and, or they don't believe in the Trinity. They believe in process theology, right? Mm -hmm. Or they don't, they don't believe in penal substitution, right? Mm -hmm. Which is fine. I don't, I think atonement theories are atonement theories. I, I don't, However, I don't think you can get around scripture where it says, you know, for your sins, <laughs> for your sins, right? Like yeah. they, or they don't, I've heard a lot of times people not believe in original sin, right? Sure. Like I've heard this, like it's, I didn't make this up. This is not. Um, and so I think probably my discernment, but again, I will go back to the constitution the method, Andy, the Methodist Church can't, ch- the United Methodist Church can't change the Constitution. So, um, so, so there's a problem there that where people may profess, so, <laughs> like the, they say, oh, yeah, we profess this, but then they don't actually live it out. And I think that's a huge problem. And so I think probably when it comes for me, it will come down to the point where I'm like, you know what, I don't think I can in all integrity say that this is a place that believes those things anymore right right and and that and this decision that i'm making is not one that i think i'm like i'm not saying that i'm going to keep this for the rest of my life right sure Um, sure there's a lot of places where i felt really called like um you know the free methodist church to me sounds like a really um has a lot oh sure sure Right, like um, yeah, yeah. Also, the Nazarenes, um, the the AME, uh, yeah, sure. African Methodist Episcopal Church. That's a church. There's a strong one here. Uh, I've always loved how they. I think a lot better than S United Methodists combine um, combine personal salvation and but also social with action, a, social action, and a robust idea of the the poor and the oppressed right but very similar to this salvation army yeah <laughs> you know i think those two within the kind of the methodist siblings do the, yeah. the best in those ways and and so those are definitely places where i feel that i could maybe go not not salvation army that's more because of my sacramental theology um but those are places where i think i could go and that the god may be leading. yeah well, so, that's great. I mean, I, I'm glad I, I, I didn't want it. And I never thought that you were like, I'm never going to change. I asked the question in a provocative way because I'm trying to provoke <laughs> more conversation. Yeah. And that's the type of piece that I think needs to be brought up. And and my fear for those who are sticking it out in the United you know, Methodist Church of those, uh, those who come from uh, classically orthodox theology is that I just feel like things are going to change fast. And and maybe maybe I'm wrong on that, no. but it seems like like even here in Mississippi, I'm just you know very much on the outskirts of what's going on with the politics in the United Methodist Conference. There was a conservative candidate who was nominated and um, pulled out, and there's no there's probably not going to be a conservative that's they're putting forward. Um, so again, uh, to be a bishop, that is, and yeah. I just feel like the the problem has been and and look. It's not just your. It's not just the United Methodist Church. And this is in the Salvation Army too. This is my big complaint for the Army right now. Is like we have a a great theology on the books, a great system in place, but if it's not going to be enforced, and you keep coming back to the Constitution, and I think like that's the piece. Like this is all there. So when people are living outside the Constitution and not enforcing it, and that's just going to keep on going down that road, and then they're going to be yeah. explicitly changing the. Um, the discipline that's that that's a scary situation for me and i just want my friends yeah. i just want i just i don't want yeah. to see you go through that yeah let, let, can i 
talk a couple things about that, yeah, sure, especially sure. for a lot. No, no, no. Especially for your listeners who aren't United Methodist, which yeah, I know sure. you have a lot. I'm a listener, but I happen to be United Methodist. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> but but I mean, like, yeah, yeah. But for people who aren't United Methodist, I understand that they may have some questions here. Uh, the United Methodist Church is put together very similarly. They are the they were the first kind of us and the Baptists were the first evangelical American denomination, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah, so, yeah sure. So, I mean, there's a reason why Superman's a Methodist, right? <laughs> <laughs> like, like, like he is kind of like the quintessential, uh, you know, you know, middle America. American. Yeah, right, yeah. right. So, like you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. Oh, no, man. I'm not Superman. God bless. Him. Clark Kent was much better than me. But, um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, so, but, so it, it mirrors the, the united states government so the general conference is the the legislature right it's all the conferences around the world get so many and they're all they all sent to general conference and they are the only ones who speak for for the church it's the general conference right and then you have the the judicial council which is basically like the supreme court Right. Right. And th- on constitutional issues, they they weigh in. And then you have and then you have the, the executive, executive branch. branch, which are the, the general ship. superintendents who and I say this. I, I know where you're deep, going. My deep love for him of Asbury. Asbury. But, yeah. but he took the name Bishop, which Wesley never said. <laughs> Right. So I st- I still refer to them. Uh, Do as, you really? Yeah, yeah. I refer to them. I try to refer to them as general superintendents for the most part because that's what they are constitutionally. Like they aren't like bishops, like the rest of the world, where where they come up with things At, during all general conference. Bishops are quiet; mm-hmm. they can't mm-hmm. speak unless they are presiding over the meeting. Right. Right. So they can't speak. So their job is to enforce the laws. Right. Their right. job is not to make the loss. So I think that maybe it helps people. That's understand good. That's a, that's a good analogy. A yeah. 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 And so, um, but as we know in our Republic, uh, it's very easy for the executive branch to take up more and more power. Mm-hmm. And it's one of the great dangers of our system, I think. Uh, and it's also a great danger within the United Methodist Church. So right now, you have uh, bishops who have not been in enforcing things for quite a long time. And um, in some ways, I don't think that's so much of a problem. If, if we lived in a different system, if we lived in an Episcopal system, right? Like the, the Anglican church or the Episcopal church or the, the Lutherans to an extent um, or the, the Catholics and Orthodox, right? Like where the bishops actually makes rules. They have Mm. actually quite a bit of of leeway, uh, more than you would think, Um, but not in the Methodist church. And so uh, where I think that they're celebrating that right now, that some bishops aren't, and it's not just sexuality. It's on a whole bunch of other issues. Sure, sure. It's a presenting issue. Yeah. Sexuality. Yeah. So, but the problem with that is, Andy, when when a group of people get used to that kind of power, they don't want to give it up. Mm -hmm. And- uh, I think that that is going to be a particular problem for the post United Methodist Church is that they have a supercharged episcopacy mm-hmm. um, that is used to a power and has been celebrated uh, by many for for uh, not enforcing rules. And, and, and to be fair to some of them, yeah. we, we kind of I don't want to go too deep in the weeds here, but we kind of had this thing where it's like we're going to call a truce. Until right. the next general conference. Right. So let's not bring up charges against everybody. Everybody, don't be doing these things. Also, everybody on the other side, let's not bring up charges. We're going to try to live into this until general conference meets. The problem is they haven't let us meet. Right. For, right. And I've got some, uh, I, I think there were some political maneuverings there. I also, right. um, that they didn't want people to meet. And so all of a sudden this peace accord, which we called the protocol, right, which was going to uh, allow people to leave and kind of this very nice, that has all fallen apart. Right. And so now 
we're under this place where there's a lot of distrust, there's a lot of hate and anger, and you have this episcopacy that because General Conference hasn't been meeting, the episcopacy has grown more and more powerful. So that is why what you're bringing up when you were saying uh, bishops are not just not doing what they're told, it's a, it's a real, real problem. And, yeah. um, and so that's one of the things that actually makes me, I don't think I realized it was a problem when I made those vows. At the- <laughs> right. And, and so my argument on the vows side, and you, you have a great argument against it. And so I can't stand against it, but my argument is they have not fulfilled their vows to you. And, and yeah. you said, well, there was a time in my life where the same thing happened to me. So I get that. That's, that's where I would be now. Uh, let me just let you know, look, there's, I think in my tradition, I don't know. I don't know where this would be for Nazarene world and that sort of thing. Like for for instance, in Nazarene world, one of the things is like some of their educational institutions have people who aren't affirming the same things they believe, particularly related to human sexuality. Mm. But there's movements that are trying to retain the orthodox positions of the church. Um, but in in my tradition, what's happening, and is that there's there's a whole host of people who are will stay no matter what. I mean, it's just like the institution and, and you're not as, I don't maybe, maybe forgive me for presuming this, but there's people whose livelihoods are so dependent upon institution. Um, they have to have like, that's their idea. They wouldn't be able to survive yeah. with, without, without it existing. So to be able to say like, to really put the pressure on to say, if, if the, we make this move, I'm out. Well, people can't realistically do that. I think the global Methodist church is setting up a scenario for that mm-hmm. to happen in a better way for people. But, it, but still, I think we're in this interesting moment where we have to think about our, what, what is the nature of the vow, or we would say covenant in the salvation army. What's the nature of that? And it, is there a point and you've said there is like, yeah. maybe, maybe it's, maybe it's just not on this issue. And maybe it's just a matter of um release on your, your side too. Like being able to yeah. know that God would release you. Oh, I, I, we only have a few more minutes, but no, 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 no. Tie us up here. Yeah, tie no, us. no. Yeah, no. For me, it really is. Um, for me, that's not the, as far as orthodoxy and dogma, like you were saying, that issue is not, I, I don't think it raises to that that's yeah yeah yeah, that's where we differ yeah 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 however um it doesn't however for me um again i i would say there's a lot of people who say well you know he's probably going along and and i listened to that podcast by uh, Dr. Renfro, right? Like where he said, he said, well, I'm not meaning to sound pejorative. And I was like, that's something's going to come out pejorative right after somebody <laughs> says that. But uh, He said, you know, if they're really concerned as being a Methodist, you know, and, and I'm just like, and being their concerns for the Methodist church. And sometimes I just want to say, brother, where's it easier being evangelical? Like mm-hmm. you're in the rich suburbs of Houston, Texas. I mean, being evangelical there, that's easy. Like being evangelical, my whole life of being evangelical in Northern Illinois, one of the most liberal conferences in the, in the, in in the world, like that's different. And it's not about being in the charge of the light brigade. He also said that because you're not going to win. Well, it's never been about winning. And then he also said, well, your ministry is going to be contentious. And Andy, there hasn't been a year of my life where ministry hasn't been contentious. Mm -hmm. Like Mm -hmm. the gospel's contentious. Like yeah. having people, um, you know, having people do this, but I, I do think there needs to be a split. And I do think that people need to be able to leave easily. Like I don't, why do, why do people want evangelicals to stay? They're making it so hard for some of these evangelical churches to stay. Um, and it's needless because they're going to be a burr under your saddle for the next 20 years. Right. Sure. You might as well let them out. You might as well let them out. Yeah, and yeah. and I respect all those people who are leaving. I don't think, I think they're great. But for me, I feel like that right now I have, like, I've been reading a lot of Habakkuk and I've been reading, like, reading about Athanasius. I've always been interested in the Cappadocian Fathers and yeah, sure. Athanasius. Like, those have always really, um, but, you know, they were faithful even right. when even when they they weren't and uh they weren't and and god may call me out but i want to say that i'm so thankful for the united methodist church 
and what it's been in my, even if I eventually leave. Right. Sure. Um, sure. The, I am thankful that they brought me to a saving relationship with Absolutely. Jesus Christ. Yeah, and, yeah. and there are people who, who I love, who have helped me grow in my faith, who I disagree with. Yeah, and, sure. and, and I have no problem with that. The congregation I'm a part of right now is very purple. It's mm. uh, which is very much the Midwest. It's a mix. Um, you know, me and my senior pastor don't agree, mm. but we are great friends. And, uh, and I will miss those relationships if those things leave, but it also won't stop me from leaving eventually. But I think the hardest thing for me, Andy, is am I, in, you know, my senior pastor, he believes in Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior and wants people to know the gospel. But if I'm working in a, in a church where I'm not for sure that's the number one priority, and people don't believe in scripture. They don't yeah. believe it's authoritative. They don't believe it's infallible. They don't, you know, you know, these are the things that um, I think that I will have to really reconsider. I just, I can't, I, I can't not at least try to be there Yeah, uh, for, for me. And, um, but I also think that I, I get from sometimes from my evangelical friends who are leaving the global Methodist church. And I think he was doing it gently. And so I try not, but like, like, you know, I, Rob, when he was on this podcast was doing it with a little bit of a sneer, right? Like, oh, geez, they're staying they're They're, you know, they really just don't want to fight, man. I've been fighting my whole life. Like mm. I've been fighting since sixth grade. Mm. <laughs> like, like, yeah. So yeah. I don't, like, what, what do you, what more do you want me to do? Like yeah. my whole existence has been that way. So, yeah. um, but I, I fairly, if, but this is, this is where I stand and I can't yeah. stand any other place. Yeah. Like, I love hearing this. I mean, like I've, I used to like a, a glad to hear more of the full story, not just a yeah. tweet in this, yeah. and, like, you know, it is a good tweet, but it wasn't like, I, we, we went back and forth a few times. So I thought, ah, this is, this is a conversation and it has been, you know, and a good hour and 10 minutes or so. And I'm really thankful for the opportunity. I I think like just as where I, where I land in general is like, I do think of this as a matter of dogma. And I think what this then raises is that the, again, this is where we might just disagree is that your, your, if your pastor feels differently, your senior pastor feels differently on this matter, that, that we might not be preaching the same gospel if this is dogma. So that's, that's part of where the distinction and, and, and like, and I know that you agree, uh, you agree with me on the nature of like how this is lived out. But that's the I think that that's the question that we're going to have to be more serious about. Not not you, me. Um, I know at WBS, we're going to host a conference where we take on that question. It, and we have Roman Catholics, Eastern Orthodox mm-hmm. um, people from a variety of disciplines coming about around to answer that question of rather not that rises to that level. Well, Brian, I. I'm going to have to cut us off because of I, I have to go, but anyway, thanks so much. Wait, is there, is there more of the story of uh, Brian Jones? I can normally ask that question. Is there something else that you like to do beyond rooting for the Cubs? <laughs> and, and shielding everybody from my, my ball <laughs> plate. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I, um, I love, uh, I I love uh, MMA and boxing. Oh, those, yeah. are my, those are my things I love. And um, I, that's why you're staying in Methodist Church because yeah, you love no, MMA. Yeah, you want to no, keep no. fighting. But those that's one of the things I was I was asking. Like, what a you know, I'm 45 now. Like, I've got 20 good years of ministry left. And so, what do I want to do with it? And one of the things I've really thought about is I want to learn, I want to be a black belt in jujitsu where I grew up. Really? Yeah. Where I grew up in rural Indiana, there was no wrestling or boxing or jujitsu. And uh, there was a lot of fighting. Like I did have to learn how to fight, but, (laughs) uh, but I won't get into all of that. Um, But, you know, uh, to be able to protect yourself in a in a way that also enables disables your your opponent, but you're not killing them. Like you're, yeah. you know, you just you just put them in sleep and then run away. Like <laughs> <laughs> so, you're doing that. Yeah, yeah. I want to. This is this is what I'm going to do for the next year. I'm I love it. Take oh, that man. up and and uh, so these are the things I'm learning. And again, it's not for me because I want to beat people up. It's not that. It's to it's to be uh, and, and be healthy. You know, yeah, I think sure, COVID sure. for all of us, you know, was not the best for us. Uh, f- at least for me, physically. So it's it's getting in shape and and uh, le- and learning some new skills. I think. 
I think I can still learn a lot in these next uh, in these awesome. next 20 years. <laughs> I love it. Brian, thanks so much for coming on. It's great to connect with you here. And I, I really appreciate the nature of the conversation and our friendship. And I'm Andy, looking I'm forward to continuing it. I, it's, a, it's a blessing. And, and thank you for your ministry. 